Okay, so we're going to move swiftly on now to Matt Stanton, who's going to tell us all about messenger RNA, how to develop, how to design and develop messenger RNA therapeutics. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll try and do something like that. Thanks, David. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I realize that we have three additional presentations in this conference. I was surprised uh, to just recognize that. And I thought, um, given that, um, I would spend a little bit of time today just kind of giving an extended introduction to the field of messenger RNA therapeutics to help contextualize those future presentations. Um, let's see if this works. Nope. Well, if I can advance the slides. Okay, <clears throat> so to start with, we've heard a lot about um, RNA and, and, and really the, the central dogma so far in this presentation, but the question we asked ourselves is what if messenger RNA itself could be a drug? Um, and I think there are some obvious advantages uh, that I'll point to here. Um, one being mRNA, we talk about it as, as a software for cellular machinery. Um, it's kind of a fancy way of saying it's a platform, and I think it, the, the advantages, the pragmatic advantages of a platform, I think, are shared with the previous presentations. Um, the way I like to think about it is once you solve all the hardware, the technical nuts and bolts of the drug, you can actually quickly advance additional drugs simply by changing sequence if, if you're uh, um, going over the same kind of modality. We've seen that certainly in our pipeline, for instance, in the context of vaccines, once we'd identified the right kind of mRNA nuts and bolts and chemical modifications and sequence design with uh, lipid nanoparticle technology for, for vaccine applications, we were able to quickly advance numerous um, vaccines behind that simply by changing the antigens that, that we're expressing. There are some clear advantages um, using the human body as a protein factory. Um, there are probably cost and manufacturing advantages. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but certainly the notion of uh, translational, um, post-translational modifications actually happening in a more endogenous manner is an attractive feature to that. Um, RNA uh, also has the, the uh, I think, feature of having transient dose-dependent expression. And the, um, the second session of today's, this morning's uh, is, um, uh, talks are going to talk about PKPD, and I think that's a, a key component there, which is you can model the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic responses, very similar to a small molecule therapeutic, um, by having a transient and dose-dependent um, expression of your protein. And the fact that the protein's already in the cell gives you some advantages in terms of where you want to redirect that. You can add signal peptides for secretion of proteins, but you can also um, target intracellular uh, domains or regions that can be very advantageous. Um, so, Additional advantages over recombinant protein therapy, um, new targets, I think uh, just following up on that last point, intracellular proteins um, is a significant advantage for, for messenger RNA versus recombinant protein therapeutics. Um, combinations of messenger RNAs, uh, you really do get this unprecedented uh, advantages of com combining multiple messenger RNAs. And I'll give you an example of that. In our pipeline, we have a vaccine for CMV um, which expresses, actually contains six different messenger RNAs. And what that allows you to do is actually express the complete pentamer plus GB complex of that antigen. And you get this really complex antigen that you can actually um, measure the structural features of that. Um, trying to do that with traditional vaccine approaches has just been impossible. And it's a huge unmet need that is now enabled by the ability to express multiple proteins in a single drug product. Um, speed, accelerated timelines. You can tell I borrowed this slide from my business, business development colleagues because it's faster to market, longer exclusivity is there. I think there, you know, I will just highlight that there are clear advantages to speed um, as a function of what we just talked about, just being able to change the sequence and generate a new messenger RNA by in vitro transcription. Um, we've seen, you know, another example of that in the vaccine space was when we decided to go after Zika. As that began to emerge, we went from um, thinking about antigen design as an idea to being uh, in the clinic in less than a year. And I think that's a remarkable achievement that's enabled by these kind of turnaround times. Um, and then the cost. I mean, it's something to, that we all have to bear in mind. Um, but I think the way we think about this is you get access to large molecules, uh, large molecule targets at small molecule prices with something like messenger RNA. So again, the, the uh, R&D costs and the CapEx costs are are much uh, much lower than for traditional 
um, recombinant protein therapeutics. So um, we tend to focus on the mRNA core technology as a set of um, tools and uh, um, uh, uh, platform advances that can be co combined into different modalities. Um, I won't belabor this, but as I just mentioned, you have these kind of the different biology and uh, certainly the chemistry and the formulations that can be combined to do vaccines, intracellular, we can do antibody therapeutics um, and secreted proteins, and all of those um, were rapidly advancing. Okay, so I hope I framed why messenger RNA therapeutics would be an attractive opportunity um, if you could pull it off, but there are obviously a couple of significant technical uh, challenges to enable that. Um, size is one of those. Um, I've actually drawn to scale here an siRNA versus a messenger RNA, and it's pretty obvious um, the size of a, a typical messenger RNA. It's a bit of a beast, and you're trying to get that across a cellular membrane. Um, so delivery really represents one of the significant hurdles to, um, to realizing the potential of messenger RNA therapeutics. The second one is uh, you have millions of years of evolution working against you, right? So um, positive single-stranded RNA viruses are the largest family of viruses in nature, and um, pattern recognition receptors are evolved to recognize those and, and, and um, have significant consequence, most of which is actually shutting down uh, protein translation. Um, and so I'll go back into this in a little bit, but basically we kind of think around these as two different classes of, of innate immune sensors. Those are the cytosolic sensors um, and the endosomally restricted uh, sensors, and they both have different um, consequences in ways that we need to think about evasion of those uh, particular sensors. And finally, if you're successful enough to solve delivery and solve innate immunity, you have to then get there and deal with the ribosome, which is the most complex machine in nature, and effectively generate protein. And some of the tools by which you would actually try to do this um, aren't always uh, consistent with ribosomal processing. So to recap, um, this is you know, the ultimate crux of why messenger RNA has uh, progressed slower than other potential biotechnology areas delivery, immunity, um, and then engaging the ribosome. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those. So back to innate immunity. Um, I tend to think about this, again, as the two different classes of sensors. There's the endosomally restricted sensors and the cytosolic sensors. Um, if you think about the cytosolic version uh, of the sensors that are present, clearly they have to be able to discriminate between self RNA and non-self RNA or foreign RNA. And that really comes into the consequence. We have the ability to control that. I think that's ultimately the, the, pre, the, the purity and, and makeup of our messenger RNA that we're delivering exogenously. If we can truly deliver 100% pure messenger RNA that has the appropriate cap structure and poly A tail, it really should not stimulate those innate immune sensors. And when I give a presentation on Tuesday, I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, uh, but suffice it to say that I think um, chemical modifications to the RNA aren't necessarily required to, uh, to minimize that particular recognition. The toll-like receptors are a different story, right? So toll-like receptors are, are geographically restricted to um, sense foreign RNA um, and, and DNA, but certainly foreign RNA in the context of TLR7 and 8. Um, there, uh, you know, our position, I'm certainly of the camp that chemical modifications are our opportunity to minimize recognition by those endosomally restricted toll-like receptors. Um, and, and in fact, unmodified RNA uh, doesn't really stand a chance of evasion of those particular things. And there are consequences for that. Again, I'll go into um, some more of that when, on my uh, presentation on Tuesday. So an example um, of the cytosolic sensors being critical and the chemical modifications, this was published work um, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania back in 2011, so it's been around a, a while, and it really highlights the need for um, purity of your RNA to minimize um, these types of you know, in vitro transcription products that can elicit these uh, innate immune uh, responses. So when you make mRNA via T7 or, or S6-mediated polymerase, um, you can have abortive transcripts, you can have run-on transcripts, um, false transcription starts. Um, it can lead to all kinds of uh, both uh, single and duplex RNA impurities, um, and you also need to control capping. 
And if you don't control that well in the context of unpurified, you can see here for both TNF-alpha and uh, interferon alpha um, stimulation, the unpurified material is much more immunogenic in this particular report. Whereas when you HPLC purify your message RNA, presumably to remove most of those, those types of impurities, you can significantly diminish that activation. Now you'll notice that the unmodified uridine here still has some innate immune signaling. And again, that's consistent with what we've observed as well, is that unmodified messenger RNA still can elicit an innate, innate immune response. I think the cap structure, I, I've used this slide before, I, you know, the early part of my career was a medicinal chemist and there's this notion of the magic methyl, which is, you know, a single methyl group added to a drug that can really change its properties in ways that don't seem to be consistent with that 14 Dalton change. This is like the ultimate magic methyl to me, which is there's a, a cytosolic proteins, um, IFITs, that have evolved to recognize the 2' hydroxyl of viral RNA and sequester that and, and shut down translation. And so this is something you're not, this is an immune response. This is essentially um, uh, an adaptive response to, to, to foreign RNA that can um, only manifest in the consequence of reduced expression. You're not actually stimulating a type one interferon response. You're not, you, there's no other way to kind of visualize this process, but simply the addition of that methyl group on the cap structure of exogenous mRNA can lead to a two log difference in expression. And I'm showing just an example with a, with a few different IgG. So these are heavy chain light chains that both contain either cap zero or cap one structure. And that 14 Dalton difference, again, gives up over a two log difference in expression in vivo um, as a function of that. So this is a very uh, nuanced innate immune recognition that you have to pay attention to as you design in your messenger RNA. So I've talked a bit about innate immunity, and again, the, the thing that um, remains is you also have to maximize protein expression. What I'm showing here is um, some of the different things you can think about for how to do that. And I'll give a shout out to the, the secondary structure in chemistry and sequence engineering that's gonna be discussed by my colleague Ian McFadian later in the week. Um, but those are the types of things where, uh, in the context of sequence engineering, to maximize protein expression, you need to think about. Um, he's specifically going to get into some of the unique uh, interplays between chemistry and secondary structure for maximizing um, expression. Um, but suffice it to say, if you're going to rely on uh, uh, chemically modified messenger RNA to avoid innate immune responses, you're going to introduce some, some nuance in, into the sequence engineering that needs to take place to maximize expression. We've shown that the protein that we generate from messenger RNA confirms uh, is, is high, uh, of high fidelity in the context of looking at both, uh, on the left here is a bioassay for um, human, uh, uh, human growth hormone, just showing versus a recombinant standard that it maintains its activity, the mRNA derived uh, retains its activity. On the right, we've looked at a few different targets in terms of peptidic digest and looking for misincorporations at the amino acid level. And we've shown that the misincorporation rate is, is very negligible and consistent with control uh, uh, misincorporation rates. Um, so that's an important consideration. Again, kind of a check when you're thinking about introducing chemi chemical modifications to messenger RNA, you wanna make sure that you're not uh, interfering with the, with the uh, translational fidelity at that point. Okay, so I've talked a bit at the mRNA level in terms of um, expression, in terms of innate immunity. I think the last thing is mRNA deliver delivery, and I'll just have a, one slide to kind of wrap this up. Um, there's some key attributes for an I ideal messenger RNA delivery vehicle. Um, we don't have the benefit of being, being able to throw a lot of 2 prime methyl into our, into our uh, um, polymer, so we can't, um, we need to actually stabilize this to, to uh, nucleus mediated mediated degradation. And so that does involve uh, the use of delivery vehicles like lipid nanoparticles or something that can actually protect the molecule from nuclease digestion before it reaches its target cell. Um, we think about um, uh, optimizing the, uh, the opsonin profile of these uh, encapsulated messenger RNAs to maximize delivery and to minimize the LMP or the delivery vehicle mediated immune effects. Um, you want to maximize cell specific uptake of course, uh, efficient endosomal escape is required. And the delivery components themselves, it's ideal if we can actually have efficient clearance of those to avoid any unwanted accumulation of some of the lipids or, 
or materials that we take into these um, formulations. Um, I use this slide just to kind of, it, it's uh, timely, I guess, in the context of Patisaram, but um, messenger RNA came along at a time, or at least the, the more recent uh, manifestation of messenger RNA therapeutics, uh, at a time when we could really take advantage of the decades of work that had gone into delivery for other nucleic acid cargo. And so what I'm showing there is a slide that Al Nilam has shown uh, historically the, the optimization of lipid nanoparticle technologies for siRNA delivery um, over time. And, and you can see going from some of the early first generation lipid nanoparticles to the second generation MC3, which is the one that's used for patisserin, represented just orders of magnitude um, improvements in efficiency of delivery uh, of that nucleic acid cargo. Um, and so when we began looking at messenger RNA uh, delivery using lipid nanoparticles, we could jump in at that kind of time point and, and, and uh, where the technology was relatively advanced. We've shown um, applying some of that technology to mRNA that um, you can get very nice uh, dose proportional uh, expression even to these um, really exaggerated levels of protein. This is uh, human um, erythropoietin, uh, erythropoietin um, where the target uh, concentration in this particular, this is in, in non-human primates, the target therapeutic concentration of that protein is shown in the left with the recombinant EPO. Even at the lowest doses, we vastly exceed that and we maintain that dose proportionality in this study using uh, messenger or LMP-mediated delivery. Um, it also highlights, I think, one of the other advantages to recombinant proteins is the pharmacokinetic profile. If you just look at the CMAX, the AUC versus the CMAX for recombinant proteins, obviously you deliver that and it, it uh, decays quite rapidly. In the context of messenger RNA delivery, you get this um, uh, slow, lower CMAX um, relative to the AUC. Um, and you, so you get a, 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 you can hit your target concentrations without having to go into this really high CMAX early on. Um, so that is the last slide that I had as, a, again, an extended introduction. Just to remind you the presentations that we have coming up, I'll give a, a much more detailed presentation um, of how we've taken these concepts and developed um, the technology to truly enable going after rare disease applications. So repeat dosing, the ability to safely and effectively go into um, repeat dose rare disease, monogenic disease applications, and I'll show all the preclinical data associated with that. Um, we're going to talk, uh, at, as I said, Ian McFadden will talk about sequence engineering and some of the um, surprising structural features that um, predominate in that particular uh, realm. And then our CMO, Tal Zax, is going to actually give a clinical update, and it's exciting that um, that six years on, we're about a six-year-old company, and we have some a, a ever-growing uh, um, set of clinical data that we'll be able to talk about at this conference as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know if we want to do that or I think we'll move, on. move on. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Matt. So we will move.